one of the most important thing I learned from from my mistakes was the domino effect. You might ignore a call right now. You might ignore a text right now as a GM of a restaurant. But the domino effect that text or call or something as simple as seeing a light in the sky, right? Or losing internet for five seconds. The things that could follow that was the things that I never understood and never learned and now know for fact because it's going to get a lot back, bigger. It's going to snowball. Yeah. This episode brought to you by Restaurant Systems Pro. With excitement, allow me to introduce to you today's guest, owner of Del Bar in BB, Fars Cargar. Fars, are you feeling unstoppable today? Feeling fantastic. Yeah. Thank you for asking. I mean, restaurant business, as you, I'm sure you know it, has ups and downs. Yeah. Can go from uh, butterflies to rainbows, and next thing you know, rain and thunderstorm coming down. And when it rains, it pours. Everybody knows that. So my go-to is always how to keep myself happy. Yeah. And motivated. All right. So where does it make sense to start telling your story? Because you didn't always know that you wanted to be a restaurateur, did you? That no. came later in life, right? That came later enough. That was basically when I started working in a restaurant for the first time. Yeah. And I had no clue what it was going to entail. But you have always loved bringing people together and using yes. food as a vehicle yes. to do that. Where did Hus- that start for you? Honestly, as an Iranian, hospitality, I feel like it's in our genes. Yeah. The Why is that? It's weird. So it's like even if you go to visit Iran or watch anybody like Anthony Bourdain's trips in Iran, they teach you about hospitality. The moment you walk in through a door, somebody hands you a tea, sits you down. The first person to eat is always the guest of honor. So tell me more about Iranian hospitality and what hospitality means to an Iranian. So hospitality to Iranian is like, so growing up as a kid, right? When you have a gathering at the house, obviously the best meal is cooked for the guests. Yeah. The best fruit goes to the guests. So when you buy fruits or when you buy anything, the best one is always reserved for when you have guests over. Yeah. That's like a big part of Persian hospitality. Is that, you, is that, that's universal throughout Persian? Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is universal through yeah. Persian. Like yeah. everything goes to the guests, guests of honor. Like even the way we came up with the concept of doing crispy rice for our rices at Del Bar was because throughout the culture and growing up, the crispy rice was the, was the delicacy portion of the rice that was always reserved for elderly or guests of honor. Yeah. So we just wanted to bring that hospitality to everyone. And me, as growing up as a kid, I, I, my mom and dad always worked. My dad was always remote, working in different states or different cities in Iran. My mom always worked. She used to design dresses for people, so you always worked. So I was all mainly up to me and my aunts and grandma, who, people that I basically grew up with, to feed my little sister and my older brother. Mm. My older brother did not know how to cook anything <laughs> he still doesn't <laughs> he still we still make fun of it but that's where my love for cooking grew. like i used i spent most of my time as a child in kitchens or in restaurants 12 and 13 was when i was going actually to grocery stores grabbing ingredients cooking things and inviting people over to my house without my parents even knowing okay so we tried to always get them to throw a party so i could cook a course yeah what was, I was your like favorite throw part? this party so i can do lasagna throw yeah. this so i can make this pizza yeah what was your favorite part about cooking for people? I think the first part was the joy and happiness of actual process of cooking mm-hmm. and accomplishing something that made other people happy. Yeah. The best thing is like when they put that spoon in their mouth and it just the face changes. Yes. That's when your heart just warms up. This is a story that not everybody knows. So yeah. growing up in Iran, um, I was a straight A student up until I think it was probably 10th grade back in college 10th grade in high school sorry 10th grade in high school then um, then one year I started hanging out I started becoming very outgoing I was just partying too much I was always out you're cooking out. for too many people cooking for too many people <laughs> always out in restaurants always going yeah. out with my friends to eat and I started failing a lot of classes like the same classes I used to be like a part time teacher kind of teaching all the other people I started failing them mm. and at the time I was working on my uh, cousin's um, paint shop. He had a paint shop. He opened a new location, a paint shop, and he asked me to go there uh, during summer and just take care of the paint shop. And the paint shop uh, used to used to have a mezzanine upstairs, and I had a little gas stove upstairs. What is a mezzanine? I don't know if that's a... a mezzanine pl- is kind of like your next floor up, but it's not really a floor up because they always have low ceilings, very yeah. smaller. And this was a paint shop, so he just had a little bit of a space up there. Okay, like storage space. Yeah, kind of storage space. 
and I've taken a little um, propane kind of uh, stove top with me over there. Yeah. And my favorite thing was inviting my friends over to the paint shop, <laughs> paint shop because I was the only one there and cooking food. It was just somebody would grab eggs, somebody would grab sausage, we would make omelets, we would make uh, food in throughout. And it was just, it was my part of, uh, became kind of entertainment part of my life mm-hmm. as I was working at this store. And I failed a lot of classes that year. I failed a lot of classes. I was going to private school, kind of a private school. And so you're like 16 years old, 10th grade, I'm assuming 16, 15, Yeah, yeah, 16, yeah. yeah. This is like 10 or 11 years yeah. old, I remember. 10 or 11, sorry. Great. Yeah, great, yeah. Then uh, <laughs> then I started failing a lot of classes. And was next it just year, cooking or were, you, was, were, were there other things happening too? Like I was always at the video game stores. Okay. Playing video games. But no drugs or alcohol? Or no, no like drugs that. or alcohol at this, that point. Not at that point. Yeah. <laughs> and I was uh, just... Having a good time. I just become very social, hanging out with a lot of kids that I thought I was cool and stuff. Yeah. And um, I just stopped paying attention to school. Then uh, next thing you know, everything leads up to basically my dad having a serious talk with me and being like, hey, your uncle is going to Turkey to become a refugee to go to U.S. You should go with him. And this was more like a one-way ticket that you will go with him. So your uncle is how old? My uncle was, uh, he's older than my dad, so it's probably in, it's like 60s. Okay. At the time, it was in like 50s. But he was uh, leaving Iran to migrate to U.S. So what was it about his situation where he needed to be a refugee? Uh, nothing. So in order from, for you to come from Iran to U.S., especially for us, that we were a minority, we were Baha'is. So uh, we're not allowed to go to college in Iran or a lot of jobs we're not allowed to have. Okay. And there's a lot of boundaries that, that society doesn't really accept us. Wait, what is it about you when you say us? What do you mean by us? Oh, the religion. We're a minority uh, religion. Okay, yeah. I gotcha, gotcha, yeah. gotcha. So I grew up as a minority religion, which in Iran you're not allowed to go to college for. Got it. Uh, you're not allowed to go to college. You're not allowed to have public jobs, doctor, engineer, all those things. Uh, we're not allowed to have. Okay. We're not allowed to be part of that society. So is this... Mo- so I know your painter, your dad was in construction, and I know mm-hmm. a lot of Iranians. I, I'm, this is all from no, the, go, go the Eater article that I read. And yeah. I think you mentioned to them that most people try to become doctors or lawyers oh, yeah. or whatever. Yeah, yeah. But because of your religion, that wouldn't that wasn't the uh, uh, wasn't on the table for you. That was not on the table for me. But also at the time, I was such a bad kid in school that yeah. my dad was kind of like, "You should go to U.S. and you should learn how to grow up on your own." It was more like uh, you should leave. <laughs> yeah, like you need to get kicked out of the nest. You need to get kicked out, <laughs> basically. Yeah. Uh, basically also. Because, you know, again, in our minority, we're with each other so much that yeah. just also... I was a bad kid. Let's just put okay. it that way. <laughs> I was a bad kid. <laughs> uh, so I ended up coming, going to Turkey and I lived in uh, Antal- sorry, uh, Kayseri for a year. Until I came to U.S. Does it take a year to the, for the process? Yeah, it, the process took a year. And that was actually good. Now it just takes anywhere from two to three. There's a lot of like FBI background checks and stuff that you have to go through um, to get here. And that's when I started getting to like Turkish food. Okay. I started cooking some Turkish food and started falling in love even more with the food. But food to me was never a profession. It was never a career at that point because I was still pretty young and naive. I'd never come to U.S. to see it as sort of a career, right? That that kind of sparkled in my head when I got to U.S. Um, I got to U.S. and I was leaving before the... Actually, the main reason I left was because of the military. Once you turn 18, you have to go to military for two years. Yeah. And it's a mandatory military now, period. because of your beliefs... Were you limited for what you could do in the military, too? No. So for my belief, you we were actually bullied and take advantage of in the military. Uh, well, yeah. So that was one of the, that's probably my, where my dad's thought process was. Yeah. My thought process was like, I'm probably screwing up in the school and my dad wants me to <laughs> go and get on my own. Get out of here before they, they get you. Exactly. Yeah. yeah, that's one of those things. What do you mean uh, by bully, taking advantage of? What kind of things happen? So when you go to the military, uh, a lot of bad things could happen to you. Yeah, the like hazing, things like that. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's, it's a lot of insanity stuff. Uh, it's like, again, so you're, you're a minority in Iran. Things are very different, especially right now with all the stuff that are happening in Iran. It's just insane. Um, you were taking advantage of any part, any ways possible. Yeah, I mean, I know America's not perfect. 
Right. Yeah. We have things we can work on. We could oh, yeah. be we could be better. But I think it's also really important for people to get some that's why I'm pulling back some of the layers. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. You, know you wanna mean? get a perspective? Perspective. Like, you know, we could absolutely be better and more inclusive, um, in this country for sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh but at the same time, man, we forget how lucky we are to have certain freedoms. Hundred percent. Like freedom of speech, freedom oh, of yeah. religion. Oh, like yeah. these are things that we just don't even like recognize as privilege. You know what yeah. I'm saying? Like we're so privileged. Anyone in this country has that privilege relative to other places where you're so restricted on things that are so personal. Like what do I believe? You know what I mean? Like no, hundred percent. I, so I, I yeah. agree with you hundred yeah. percent. This is a this is a part that even me as living here for like 10, 12, 13, 14 years. Now that I look at look back at the media and the news and what's happening back home, like holy shit, these things were actually. We weren't allowed to do these things. Now I looked into it. It was like, okay, I couldn't go out wearing shorts. I couldn't go out holding a girl's hand. I couldn't go out with the girls showing their hair. I couldn't ever say this in public or sing in public or dance in public. Or not even worse, being minority, you couldn't go to college. You couldn't have a store. Yeah, like they th- knew you had a store, they would come and shut you down. We don't even think of religion in this country as minority. No, not you at know all. What I mean, like yeah. that's not even on the spectrum of like who cares what you believe. Oh yeah, you know? yeah. But in a lot of countries, that's a big deal. Yeah, it's huge, right? Because yeah. a lot of time, the like the whole the entire government is run being run based off of religion, mm. which is never a good thing. But <laughs> yeah, but a lot of times it does happen. Um, so you you. You're a refugee. You you get you go, you make it through the process. A year later, you 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 leave Turkey, um, previously in Iran, and you find yourself in the United States. Exactly. So and, you, and I didn't have as hard of a time as a lot of people do because I had some family here. So I actually had an aunt that I she had left Iran a long time ago, and a lot of family that I had here were families that I never grew up with. So it wasn't very comfortable, obviously. But I lived in my aunt's basement. And I was uh, going back to high school because I never finished high school due to that mandatory army that I had to go to and flee in the country. So I'm going to high school. I'm getting a part-time job at Kroger as a bagger and cashier. And I used to walk to work. One day I go to pick up my paycheck and I see this. I was very tired of bagging food for people, let's just say. (laughs) (laughs) There's only only so much of that you can do. I've been there. I hear you. Yeah. and one day I'm picking up my paycheck and I see this now hiring sign in front of a restaurant. I'm like, okay, I mean, I love food. Uh, let's go see how it goes. And my English was very, very broken up back then. Um, I was also one of those kids that thought I would never go to U.S., so why do I need to study English? It's yeah. one of those things. But I pop in there and actually uh, their general manager, my friend at the time, Polo Castro, and John, uh, <laughs> John Solis, who were the executive chef of the restaurant, they were, it was before they were opening. So Say those names one more time. Uh, Polo Castro he, and John Soilus. Okay. Yeah. These two actually just opened a restaurant together. Just opened a steakhouse last week that I went to their soft opening. And it was like a family reunion. I saw oh, a lot awesome. of faces that I already knew. <laughs> the, was it John? It was the second? Uh, so, sorry. Uh, John Soilus. Soilus. And yeah. what was the, the ge- second gentleman? Polo Castro. Polo. Got yeah. It. So this is your first kind of like impression of the restaurant industry. oh yeah the yeah. first ever i mean i had no clue and i met some of my favorite and some people that i call them cousin now because we're so close of a friend so what kind of restaurant was this it was the italian restaurant okay it was the italian restaurant opening duluth and i went in there they gave me an application i filled it out they hired me i had no idea why and they took go told us hey be here this day this time and i show up that date and time and we're kind of in a lineup kind of scenario standing next to each other and one of the friends of me that is actually a good friend now his name is alberto he asked me he said, what position were you hired for i was like i don't know i couldn't <laughs> even remember a name they used like server assistant or buster i couldn't even remember yeah it. um so we start working <laughs> we start working and i remember uh first night soft opening night and uh, this is where all the passion basically came on like i was i was in u.s i was going to high school i was trying to go to georgia tech to study architecture and then from there go to interior design and that was my passion because my dad was um, an architect and uh, he was a contractor who built homes so that's familiar yeah, yeah. exactly yeah. like from being a little kid i used to grab his blueprints and sketch him and write them and my dad would give my brother and i like little projects of hey 
how do you feel we should build a house in this space? So we would just sketch things. So sketching and doing those kind of things was always a goal. And one of my dream always was to learn that and do a family business with my dad and my brother. I bet this is serving you well today, especially in this scenario we're sitting in. Oh, right it's now. fantastic. <laughs> it's actually my favorite part of a job is yeah, this. Yeah. And yeah. to paint the picture for the listeners, if you don't, if you're not watching the video, you should be subscribing to our YouTube <laughs> channel, by the way, because there is video. We're sitting in your newest location, BB which is a fast casual in the Ponzi city market. Um, so anyway, but you're, you haven't opened yet. Like they're haven't surrounded yet, by yeah. like ladders and yeah. uh, construction zone right zone. now. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so you're designing restaurants and using the skill that you grew up with. Oh, a hundred percent. Yes. So take it from there. Sorry. To, to really so where were we? Yeah. So I've been in that restaurant, got a job. Uh, first day we show soft up at the opening, yeah. soft opening yeah. night, right? First day we show up, you know, we started actually going to training and I still didn't know what my job to do work because it never worked in the restaurant and it was very hard to communicate. There were a lot of funny things that happened the first night. And so first night that was a server assistant, the server that was the assistant too, her name is Gigi, who is now married for a long time to the same general manager, Polo Castro. And Gigi is Turkish. Okay. And Gigi is obviously very seasoned steakhouse kind of waiter. And I'm working with her and I'm her back waiter and she's constantly asking me for things that I had no clue what they were. Like some, some of the most basic stuff was like, imagine. An example. Oh, examples are very funny. So somebody asked me for, uh, <laughs> somebody spilled something on their shirt, I remember. Then they asked me for soda water. I didn't understand what they said. There was a guy I used to work with, his name was John. And I used to always go to John and repeat back what I heard so John would tell me what it oh, was. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Because I didn't understand everybody needs it. Everybody John. Yeah, everybody <laughs> needs a John, right? Yeah. So I go back to John. I was like, they said this. John is like, go ask them again because I don't get what you're saying. Go back and ask him soda water. I go back to the kitchen. I think to myself, soda is Coke. Water is water. I'll bring you a cup of Coke and a cup of water. To them. <laughs> bring me a soda and a water. S- soda water. Oh, yeah. It was one of the funniest things. I remember... Um, I can't remember this was me or I got all my cousins into restaurant business too afterward. So <laughs> I remember it was me or one of my cousins. One guest asked us for sweet water. So we went to the back, grabbed a cup of water and some spoon in the packages for sweet water. What is sweet water? <laughs> sweet water is a beer. Oh, <laughs> is like, it really? Okay. Yeah, it's a yeah. big See, brewery in Atlanta. <laughs> no, 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 a big brewery in Atlanta, which we had no idea about. <laughs> so I did a lot of those mistakes and this is how I actually learned. So yeah. I had a manager at the time. Uh, <laughs> I never forget him, Juan. Like one year in the same company, I was awarded the best employee of the year. And Juan, when he was announcing it, made the coolest little comment. He was like, This is one man that I know that he's learned everything from his mistakes. <laughs> and I was true. the one with the most amount of mistakes. And Every mistakes is how you learn. Was once a disaster. Oh, man. yeah, 100%. And you can't become a master until you're willing to be a disaster. Oh, excellent. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. 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 It's like your, I mean, your biggest coach is always your failures. Yeah. For yeah. sure. So you said like this was that this is what did it for you. I think this that's was what I, I did it for. So me, what yeah. was it exactly that was doing it for you? Uh, so there's multiple things, right? Um, this was a restaurant group that had a lot of restaurants uh, from Tex-Mex Grills called Fronteras to and the whole company was called North End Group. And throughout this journey, I met the owner of the restaurant, which I looked up to him still today. Why? I still talk to him just because of how he made it. How his story it? was very interesting. He, uh, him and his wife actually came to U.S. to go to Georgia Tech for uh, mechanical engineering. And to be able to afford school, he was selling tacos part-time. And that's how you started with the Frontera Tex-Mex concept and just grew into this gigantic restaurant group. Okay. And that he was a such a personable, such a nice man that I just loved talking to him. And he was always one of those owners that would come in the restaurant, knew everybody's name and... Sh- shake their hands, ask them how their family was. I knew everything about everyone. And that's, that was one part of it. The other part was the entire lifestyle. You know, restaurant business is it's very difficult. It's always moving. Nothing is always the same. Things are always changing. There's always chaos. I fucking love it, though. I dude. love chaos. Yeah, that's too. the thing. That's the biggest part that just made me want to go to this business because I would sit behind a desk and study for school. I already knew I didn't like sitting behind the desk. Yeah. <laughs> I hated that. I hated that. And from the same restaurant, I worked my way up from a server assistant to assistant GM. And Wait, you I went from server assistant to assistant GM? No, it's step by step. Okay, I was no, no, say, no, 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 not over step. time. No, yeah. no. I've done that in another job, actually, from server to okay. GM, but that didn't end well. <laughs> <laughs> but, 
yeah so i was we'll working in the same restaurant we'll get there yeah <laughs> we'll get there i started working there and i started loving it i was like i just love doing this like as soon as we had downtime i would be in the kitchen helping chefs cook helping line cooks cook i would go back to the pizza station and make my own pizzas and i started just creating that love and passion for it and i remember one day i came to a restaurant on my off day sitting at a bar having a beer or eating something i love the food there uh to me, it's like if you ask me, if you don't love the food in a restaurant, you should never work there. Yeah. It's the biggest thing. You're going to sell it. And if you don't yeah, love it. It's, it's the biggest thing. Yeah. You're just not going to have that passion for it. Um, so I was sitting behind the bar. I remember my manager at the time, Juan, and the same chef, Chef John, were behind the bar. And I told him, hey, guys, I just, at the time, I was going to Georgia State studying business uh, before I went to, uh, before I wanted to go to Georgia Tech. I was in Georgia State. And I went back, I was sitting at the bar, I was talking to them, I was like, hey guys, I want to change my major from business to hospitality. I want to I wanna learn how to own a restaurant and work in a restaurant and do this. And they both laughed at me, they looked at me, and they were like, do you not see us? Do you not work with us? <laughs> yeah. Do you really want to do this for the rest of a yeah. life? Is this what you choose? This is the reaction I got from my parents when they, who owned restaurants when I told them I want to open my own restaurant someday. They're like, did you not learn anything <laughs> in your childhood? Like, no. Go. Yeah. Anyway, keep going. No, the, the, that, was the, that was the biggest thing yeah. I would get. And it's like being coming from Persian family, you move to U.S., all this stuff. Like, the expectation is for you to be a lawyer, doctor, engineer. That's yeah. it. There's no other way around it. So that was a... Um, the way I sold it to my parents was different. I didn't really sell it. I just told them, hey, this is what I'm going to do. Yeah. And I they was were, curious about that. How, they, how did they take that? They didn't take it very well, but they didn't tell me much. I found out from rest of the family members that how they took it. Yeah. But um, like even my college friends when I used to, my high school friends at the time, when I used to tell them, they were all like, really? You want to do this for the rest of your life? Yeah. I was like, do you not want to be successful? You know what's funny? This was a group of three guys. All three of them are restaurant business now. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah. wow. Did you suck them in? <laughs> no, no, no. They're, they have their own. Oh, uh, yeah. They have their own ventures, gotcha. which is uh, which is such a cool thing. But um, but you're 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 touching on something, and I don't mean to take you too really too far no, off your yeah. story. That there is this 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 stigma associated with the industry, and I don't know about you, man, but like there are certain things that ha- I, that happen in the restaurant industry. I can't do well. I'll be the first person to admit. I, I'm I'm a I'm a great support role in the restaurant. I love being the support role. I've always been able to recognize the people who are the, the, the rock stars, the bartenders, the servers, the chefs. And I'm like, wow, you guys are freaking good. Like, and I've always really accelerated in, 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 like, in supportive roles. Like my favorite position in the restaurant industry is a host. But I take that I take that position to the next fucking level, though. You know what I mean? I love that position, and I I'm searching for ways to be there for other people and to take uh, a tray off of a server's hands or to to look for an opportunity to see a guest that's like you know like being ahead of the the the, the problem. The, yeah, and it's like yeah. putting things up before they even become a problem. And I love that. Um, anyway, but the point being is like I can't do certain things that people are really good at in this industry. And I don't think most people realize how hard it is to, to be a server or a bartender. To, 100%. To like, it's amazing. And no, like, to me, no a lot respect. of people don't get it. Yeah. You're 100% right. Yeah. Uh, a lot of people look at it from outside. I was like, oh, I love doing this. I love yeah. owning a restaurant. Can you, can you open a restaurant for me? This and that. I was like, I don't think you understand what owning a restaurant means. Mm. It's a 24-7 job. Yeah. If there was more hours in a day, it would be more hours of a job. Yeah. <laughs> for sure. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> and nothing ever stops. I mean, yeah. from 1 a.m. hood cleaning to shutting down a restaurant to grill going down, this going down. Uh, anything you think it can possibly happen. So you're telling people you're starting to come to terms with yourself and what your passion is. And you're like, I don't know how, this is, how people are going to receive this news. <laughs> no, 100%. So it's, it is actually very funny. I. Uh, I, I was still torn. I was like, I wasn't hundred percent. So I was like, I was thinking to myself, do I want to go to culinary school and become a chef? Then I'm thinking, I was like, okay, I don't think I need that to own a restaurant because I've seen chefs get hired and work different restaurants. And I don't really want to be the guy that works in the back of a house all the time because then I would, wouldn't know what's going on in my front of a house. So I scratched that out. And I had an aunt at the time who was actually a ke- uh, mm, chemical engineer from Georgia Tech who was trying to go to law school and she did a couple of like uh, part-time jobs in different law schools and then until she found out she wanted to go to 
culinary school. And so she helped me clear up my mind. She was like, she was in culinary school at the time, or she was switching to it at least. Um, then I realized, okay, this is not what I want to do. Maybe I just want to learn the management part of it. So I stayed in that restaurant and grew as much as I could until I found out, okay, there's not a whole lot more that I need How to learn from here. I was there for five years. Oh, wow. That's plenty of time. Yeah, that's plenty of yeah, time. Yeah, yeah. I bet your English got much better there. Oh, time, 100%. So. <laughs> yeah, that's literally where I learned my yeah. English. And a lot of people used to tell me, it's like, you have a little bit of a Spanish accent. I was like, yeah, probably, because <laughs> I learned my English from Latinos. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's a little different. That's awesome. So when the time came to open my restaurant, I feel like I was ready. And some people have asked me, it's like, hey, you stayed there too long, blah, blah, blah. I'm like, no, I feel like I stayed there a perfect amount of time because I learned everything I could. Seven years? Seven years, yeah. I don't think that's too long. To like I don't think it's too long. I mean, some no. people take a risk, but I don't think that's for everything. But you're also building a network, too. And I think that that's other people... Big, yeah, yeah. That's, that's the one thing that people understand the value is, like, you're getting a network. Yeah. This is what I teach my servers every now and then when I go to the lineups. It's like, you could be here for as a stepping stone through your life, through your trying to figure out your modeling career or acting career, a lot of those things, or until you graduate college. But the way I see this restaurant... It's a job or service, server job in, in general. You're getting paid to network. That's it. If you, there's one thing you're going to ever take away from this job is networking. Because yeah. your future boss or your future mentor or any idol that you might have in your life, you're most likely is serving their table right yeah. now. Yeah. And you are, you said it, it took you like three months to go from server to, to GM. Yeah. Where yeah. were you after seven years? Three to five months, I think. I was still a GM. You're still a GM. I was still a GM. I was actually a GM. Then I was downgraded from a GM because I didn't understand what a GM was. And that's the part that like I learned a lot from. Because I learned how it is to bump somebody up to a position without uh, explaining to them what the expectation is. Where were you falling short as a GM? A lot, actually. Actually, now that I'm running a restaurant, I'm understanding how much more goes into it. And how much more uh, there was that I wasn't looking at. I, thought, I really thought... Well, being GM to different restaurant group could mean different things, right? So what does it mean to you? What, reflecting at what a GM is to you today and what you were when you were falling short of being a GM, what weren't you doing well? A GM to me today is a person, is you're basically the owner of a restaurant. You're looking you're treating at today. Like you're treating you own it. Oh, 100%. hundred yeah. percent. You're in there when it's needed. You're fixing things when it's needed. When Security the system calls yeah. you at 2 in the morning, you're there. 5 in the morning, somebody needs to get in. When the GM the quits, the restaurant owner comes in and does that job. That's literally what it is. Yeah. And that's the that's the that's one of the biggest things. Like you're looking at today, you're looking at tomorrow, you're looking at next week, you're looking at next month. At the same time, you're involved with every little thing in the restaurant. Yeah. So what weren't you doing as a GM? Where, like Again, like if, if you could reflect back, if you could critique yourself and make yourself cry if the younger version of yourself was sitting, it was me. What would you tell me right now? What were you doing wrong? Don't make me cry. But <laughs> no, no, I won't make you cry. Um, there was a lot of like there was a financial aspect of it that I did not understand at the time. What didn't you understand? Like how to run a PNL, how to do those things, how to go after the cost. Were you looking at PNLs? Um, not as much as I should have. How sh- how often should you look at a PNL? Very often. Very what often. You, what are you looking? You at? should. So a lot of times I've learned how to re- run a restaurant from a PNL. Yeah. But we spend on different categories, what our margins are, what our expectation is, and what we want to be, right? Mm-hmm. So a lot of things like I learned a lot that when I was opening my restaurant, I built the entire budget around the restaurant from the, some old P&Ls that I had. Yeah. And I was playing around with numbers to figure out, okay, what should my budget be for this? How much should I spend for this? All those little things of it. But that was just one aspect of it. The other aspect of it was mentorship. Mm-hmm. I just didn't know enough about how to mentor people to be better at the job, to feel good about themselves, to overcome all the struggles they're going through personally, you know, through their families, all of those things, and didn't have the eye for every little thing. So imagine, it's like I was, again, from five months of being in server, I was promoted to GM with almost no expectations. Then everything was taught to me through the yelling process. It was like, oh, you're missing this, you didn't do this, you didn't do that. So I learned everything the hard way. And... That was, it's funny because that's actually my, my love language of learning things. I learn everything through all yeah. way. I do most amount of mistakes possible yeah. um, and learn, okay, this is how not to do it. So there's only so many ways left. What were the, like, just still two of the biggest mistakes you made, the hard things you learned? Ooh. 
two of the biggest mistakes of it. One, expectation. Yep. I didn't set an expectation for myself. We, we covered that. So that's your one. What's the second thing? Um, there are a lot of things that I didn't pay attention to from time to time that came to bite me in the butt in the future. Like what? A lot of little things. I'll under the bi- I think one of the most important thing I learned from from my mistakes was the domino effect, right? You might ignore a call right now. You might ignore a text right now as a GM of a restaurant. But the domino effect that text or call or something as simple as seeing a light in the sky, right? Or losing internet for five seconds. The things that could follow that was the things that I never understood and never learned and now know for fact because... I see a little thing going wrong. I was like, okay, this, this, and that's going to go it's wrong. It's little right now, but when, when I look away, it's going to get a lot back, bigger. It's going to snowball. Yeah. From like one dish coming back to the